Glad you could be here this evening and welcome everyone and encourage you to turn out to the book of Nahum as we continue in our study of the prophecy of Nahum has uh, revealed in the scriptures. We are uh, chapter 2, if you turn to chapter 2 please, we'll begin in verse 2, look at that a little bit more tonight and proceed from there through chapter 2. We remember that Nahum is the first of the minor prophets that we have studied in the period of Judah alone. Until this time, as far as we can tell, the prophets prophesied during the divided kingdom. But now the northern nation has fallen to Assyria, and Nahum is prophesying against Assyria uh, because of their wickedness, as we will see. And in particular, that's then the theme of the book that's prophesying against Nineveh, the capital city of Nahum. Chapter 1 talks about God's character and how, because of his character, he must punish Nineveh. And the chapter, second chapter, as we get into it, we'll talk about the fall of Nineveh, the, the siege and so forth. And the last chapter, again, emphasizes the reason why this is deserved. So if you look back at chapter 1, there were some things we learned about the character of God that showed why he had to punish Nineveh. What was the connection between the punishment of Nineveh and God's character? Tell me one thing about his character that we learned in chapter 1 that ties to the theme uh, Karen. Uh, God is a jealous God and they have returned to their idolatry. Okay, so first of all, it's the jealousy of God that uh, he had a right to expect them to worship him as the only true God, but instead they were worshiping idols uh, and he had a right to oppose, oppose that and object to it. Anything else about the character of God that we learn in chapter one? Susie. He's long suffering. All right, that he is slow to anger, he's long suffering. And so, uh, even though he gave them the opportunity, even sent Jonah, you remember, to preach to Nineveh, nevertheless, if they don't uh, repent and do what's right, there's going to be punishment. Anything else we learn about God's character from chapter one? Uh, Rick. He's an avenging God. He's going to do what he says. All right, so he has the right to take vengeance because he is God, because he is the creator. He has the right to punish those who will not serve him, uh, and he will. He's uh, determined to do what's right because that's part of his character. He has, his character compels him to do uh, what he needs to do. All right, so we learned a number of things about the character of God in the uh, first chapter, and it's really important to understand why the things that we're reading about in the book of Nahum, uh, how they tie to his character, because that's the basis upon which he, he acts. And we learned then that uh, he's willing then to take the stand that he is. So we get into chapter 2 then. Oh, okay, we talked about the destruction that would come upon Nineveh. And now in chapter 2, he talks about the fall of Nineveh. And uh, he begins describing the siege as we look at the first five verses there uh, of chapter 2. Uh, we were in verse 2 last time and had some questions that we wanted to finish up with before we get in. But let's go ahead and read some more before we... Uh, get into it. Who'd like to read chapter 2 verses 1 through... Let's read 1 through 7. Who'd like to read chapter 2 verses 1 through 7? For us, please. Chapter 2. Bill, please. Verses 1 through 7. He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort. Watch the road. Strengthen your flanks. Fortify your power mightily. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers of empty them out and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The charlots, the chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk, they make haste to their walls, and the defense is prepared. The gates of the river are opened, and the palace is dissolved. It is decreed they shall be led away captive. They shall be brought up, and their maidservants shall lead her as with the voice of doves, beating their breasts. Okay, so as we look... Uh at verse 1, 
He's describing uh, the siege of Nineveh. The enemy, who of course is Babylon, has come and the siege has begun. And Nahum is very powerful in his descriptions. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. What's the significance of that? What's he, what's he telling Nineveh to do in those expressions? Terry. You need to do everything you can to prepare for this, but it's not going to do any good. Okay, so get ready, it's coming. But of course, as Terry said, before we're through the obvious points, it's not gonna help you. But that's what naturally you would do. If you see the enemy coming, you're gonna get ready. And so he's, he's, he's saying, go ahead, try, uh, and we'll see what happens as we go along. Okay, so they're to prepare for the coming of Babylon. Then in verse two, the New King James says, the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob, and most other translations say that as well. But Ralph pointed out at the end of a class last time that uh, the, King, the old King James says something different rather than restoring the excellence of Jacob. It says what? Anybody remember or have a old King James? What does it say? Brahma. It says he has turned away the excellency of Jacob. All right, so the King James says he turned away the excellence. The New King James and every other translation that I checked says he will restore the excellence. Turn it away, restore it. Sounds the opposite. And yet, if you think about it, it seems to me that they're both true. In what sense might they both be true? He turned away the excellence, but he restores the excellence. Uh, uh, Frank. Well, he had <clears throat> turned away from them and caused them to be taken captive. And now, <clears throat> after their time in captivity is over, and those that the Assyrians that took them took them captive, will themselves be overrun and taken captive to restore, eventually restore, uh, restore them to their home. Well, that's what I thought too. Uh, obviously you have a question of translation, but neither one uh, contradicts anything that we're studying. They're both true. God turned away their excellence that they went into captivity because of God's decision, but he's going to bless them. It was, uh, the victory of Babylon over Assyria, which would free them from the Assyrian domination. So that's what I thought about it. Two other comments on the idea of the difference in the translation there, anybody? All right, then it says the uh, emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. And uh, Susie had a comment on that, uh, which was different from what I had said. So Susie, you want to explain again what you took that to mean the empty years emptied them out? Last part of verse 2. Um, let me think. For the empty years, uh, I was thinking that that meant the Babylonians, that the Babylonians were the empty years had emptied them, the Assyrians, out and ruined their fine branches. Or... No, that, that's enough. That's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, now you, <laughs> you've gone the opposite way now. Uh, well, I said, that's what I said last time, was that it was the, the Babylonians were emptying out the uh, Assyrians. But you said last time that it was the Assyrians emptying out uh, Israel, uh, Judah. And after I said it, Morris, I agree with what you said last time. <laughs> In fact, that's what I had in my notes last time. I said something different from what I had in my notes. Uh, obviously, they're, again, they're both true. Just a question of uh, which. But it seems to me like because of the first part of it, uh, he's, he's talking about Jacob, the emptiers who had emptied out Jacob, emptied them out, emptied Jacob out. So that would have been Assyria that emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. But the Lord's going to restore them. Now, after Assyria emptied them out, that's what, uh, Susie. I, I remember now. <laughs> because... Um, He's restoring Judah because As, um, Assyria had emptied them out. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's what you said last time, and, yeah. and I agree with you now. <laughs> Actually, I had that in my notes anyway. Okay, other comments on verse 2. Okay. So, now then, it seems to me, back to verse 1, he's again describing the siege. And so here comes the, the enemy, which would be the Babylonians, attacking Nineveh, it seems like, in verse Three, and what are some things it says about them as they attack? Uh, 
question number five. There are some things about them are described. What is it, how does it describe the coming of the Babylonians in verse three? Okay. Well, it sounds like a mighty army, constant mighty men. Says and valiant men in scarlet chariots come with flaming torches. So, sounds like a lot of a, a mighty army. Okay. A mighty army and a fearsome army, too, it seems to me like. Oh, Frank, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, it, it mentions that their shields are red, their soldiers are, are clothed in scarlet. It made, made me think that they are scarlet from the blood of the murders, uh, the killing that they had done. Okay, all right, that's one thought of the comments on uh, verse 3 and the description. Chariots come with flaming torches and uh, spears are brandished. Uh, Rick. And you read that and think, it, think of it. You put yourself in that situation. How scary of a scene that would be to see something like that coming at you. For especially for people that has been used to being so mighty and powerful in the past to see this coming at him. Yeah, I think that's what Nahum is doing. He's describing this in a way to make, to show us Nineveh, Assyria, what uh, what they're about to face. That this is going to be a, a shocking and a fearsome attack, which they're not going to be able to, no matter how they prepare, verse 1, they're not going to be able to to deal with this because of the fearsomeness of Babylon. And ultimately where he's going is Babylon's going to do to you just like you've been doing to other people. The, the shoe's on the other foot now. That's what I, where he's going with this. Other comments on verse 3, anybody? Okay. And then some more, verse 4. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. They are very descriptive in showing us the, the coming of the army. Okay, comments on verse 4? Anybody? Terry? Well, it's just going to be chaos. It's going to be chaos when not an orderly thing at all. It's going to be chaos within the city. Chaos for the Assyrians. I, I, I mean, the Babylonians, they know what they're doing. Right. Uh, but the, for the Assyrians, and we're, I think we're going to see even more of that as we go along into verse 5 that the, uh, the Assyrians aren't ready for this. Uh, they, uh, to them, it's uh, overwhelming. But the Babylonians know what they're doing, and so it's, it's a fearsome thing to face this in. Uh, Nahum's trying to help them to see that. Other comments through verse 4, anybody? I know verse 5, he has the, uh, the nobles. What about the nobles? What's going to happen with them? Verse 5. Right. Well, as they hasten to make a defense and run to the walls, they're, they're hastening and, uh, so much that they stumble, uh, that they have lost control. Okay, other comments on verse 5? That's what I saw too. Okay, here comes the enemy. All these things, the chariots and the shields and the spears and all this. And, and so, back to verse 1, get ready. Well, the, it's like the, the nobles, that is the leaders, uh, they're not ready for this. They haven't, I mean, they've been attacking other people, but they're not prepared for an attack against them. And they're stumbling and they're, they're, they're hastening, but they don't, they're not prepared. They try to get it ready, but, but they don't, uh, they're not adequate for the situation. That's what I saw as well in verse 5. Comments? Anybody else has on verse 5? Okay, so as the enemy comes and they're frightened, and I mean the Assyrians are frightened, um, they're, they're trying to make a defense, but they're, uh, the leaders aren't really ready for it. Now verse 6, the gates of the river, river are open and the palace is dissolved. Okay, comments on verse 6. And we're on question number 8 now. 
comments on uh, the gates and the river being open, so thoughts on that, Frank? Well, I think I mentioned the last time that I, I ran in a, one of the study helps that at the, that time there had been a great flood on the Tigris River and it washed away part of the fortress walls that allowed the Medes and the Babylonians to, to enter into the city. Okay, and we talked earlier in the, describing the city how that part of its defense was uh, waterways and rivers that surrounded it and uh, that was part of their defense against their enemies because it would be hard for the, an attacking army to cross the, the rivers to attack the city but that works great as long as it stays the way you expect it to but if as Frank said it floods and now it becomes a part of the problem. Now it's flooding the city or uh, causing parts of the city to be destroyed. Uh, now you can now the rivers that used to be your friend and have now become your enemy. Okay. Other comments? Verse 6. That shows God's power and his intervention in controlling things in a natural way. Okay. Other comments? And especially obvious that it's God behind it because God's predicting it. He knows all along, ahead of time, what's going to happen. Okay? Okay. Now verse 7. What's the outcome of this in verse 7? There's the enemy approaching and the walls and the people are... The, Leaders are not ready. The rivers are uh, not cooperating. And what's the result? What's the outcome, verse 7? Terry. Well, in, in the last part of verse 6, it says the palace melts away. That's uh, the symbol of the palace is a symbol of the authority, the power within the gates of that city. It's gone. So everyone in it is going to be carried away, even the mistresses of the palace um, are carried away and uh, shamed. Okay. All right, so where they've been taking other people captive, now they're going to be taken captive. Again, it's, it's turn about because they're being punished for their own sins now. Okay. Other comments? Verse 7, Susie. Um. The first part is it is decreed. In other words, God has said it's going to happen. You can't do anything about it. It's decreed. Okay. okay. So again, no matter what preparation they make, it's not going to be adequate because it, they're not dealing with just an army. And they're certainly not dealing with a God, a God like they're used to dealing with because this isn't just a God. This is the God, the one true and living God. It's, so we discussed in the earlier discussions how that they, their concept of their gods was that the god of this city would fight for their city and the god of that city would fight for their city. Uh, and sometimes this god would win and sometimes that god would win, but this isn't just a god of the many gods. This is the god that they're dealing with. That's decreed, and there's nothing that's going to change it. Okay? Other comments on verse 7. All right, I'm asking you, do you have any comments on the uh, voice of the doves? Question number nine, last part of verse seven. Made servants shall lead us with the voice of doves. Do you have any thoughts on that? Rick. That's one of the things, when I first read that, I thought of doves of being something joyful. But then when I got to studying it, through a couple of concordances that is actually in mourning. Okay. So, so the sound that doves make is a mournful sound. Uh, and that's what I took it to mean too. So that there's these, the, the women uh, are weeping, beating their breasts, uh, the voice of doves, mournful sound because the city has fallen. Other comments on verse uh, 2 verse 7, anybody? 2 verse 7. 
All right, let's read some more. Oh, Su Susie? Well, I was just going to say Isaiah uh, 38, verse 3. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's Isaiah 38, verse 3. Like a crane or a swallow, so I chattered. I mourned like a dove. My eyes failed from looking up. O oh, Lord, I am oppressed. Un undertake for me. Okay, great. Where was that? Isaiah 38, verse 14. Very good. Anything else on verse 7, anybody? Okay, let's read some more then. Uh, let's go ahead and read the rest of it. I would like to read verses 8 through 13. Chapter 2, verse 8 through 13. You'd like to read that for us, please. Verse 8 through 13. Uh, Tim, please. <clears throat> the men of old is like a pool of water. Now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. Take spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side, and all their faces are drained of color. Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where, where the lion walked, the lioness and lions cubs, cub, and no one made them afraid. The lion tore in pieces enough for his cubs, killed for his lioness, filled his caves with prey and his dens with flesh. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke and the sword shall devour your young lines. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. Okay. So, verse 8, he compares Nineveh to what in verse 8? Bill. A pool of water. A pool of water. So I ask you a um, question, I think it's number 10. What, is, what was important about water in those days, still today too, but especially in those days, and especially a, a, a place where there would, where you find water, what was that especially important in those days? Karen? Well, Nineveh and many places were situated in um, maybe not a desert, but very dry area. It wasn't lush vegetation, rivers, springs, everywhere. Okay, so these, it's for us, especially we, we had a summer which seemed like it rained almost every day. It's not that way where they were. Uh, and when you read the story of Abraham and, and Isaac and, and so on, you remember how important water was for their animals. And a lot of times they'd even fight over a well or a, 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 an oasis. So Nineveh was known for water. And that's part of why it was a, a growing and prosperous city. Because it had uh, this m means to provide uh, water. But something's changing in verse 8. That's what it was of old. But what's happening now? And as the verse proceeds, it's terrible. the water is flowing away from them, and they can't stop it. There's no halting of what's happening. Okay, so now they flee away, and it's the water. I think maybe not even just the water, but the people. The people are leaving. The enemy's coming. The people are fleeing, and the, the people cry, "Halt! Halt!" I I take that to mean the the leaders saying, "Wait a minute! Don't, don't run away." But stay and fight, but no, nobody turns back. They don't listen. So the city is being defeated. Uh, like a, um, well, as, as Terry's illustration, a pool of water that's being drained. But in any case, the, they're not willing to stay and defend it because the enemy is so fearsome. Okay. Other comments on eight? Anybody? Anything? And now verse 9. What's going to happen in verse 9? Now we're in question number 12. What's going to happen to the city? Verse 9. Uh, 
Rick. All of the riches, everything she has, of any value whatsoever, will be taken. She'll be left desolate. All right. Other comments? She's so going to be spoiled. The enemy is going to take spoils of Nineveh. Uh, this city, he says, they have no end of treasure, wealth of every desirable prize, but where did they get that treasure? Where did they get their wealth? Plundering. From plundering other nations, other cities. So again, the tables are being turned. They, they're used to, their their. Uh, armies would go and take other cities and the wealth of other nations and that's how they got their wealth. That's how they got rich. But now somebody else is going to come and make plunder of them and spoil them. There's no end of treasure and every desirable prize because they took it from other people but now the spoil the silver and the gold is going to be taken away from them. Okay? Other comments? Verse 9. Anybody? Uh, Susie. Um, I, one of the things that I read that the words used empty, desolate, wasted that they're similar sounding words but they increase in intensity so it's like you're heading to a climax of the scene and it's, it's total destruction okay now let's, uh, in fact let's, let me give you a quotation this is, describes a city that Assyria had uh, defeated and spoiled to show how they treated other people. This is the city of Thebes in Egypt. It says, silver, gold, precious stones, the goods of his palace, all there was, brightly colored in linen garments, great horses, the people, male and female, two tall obelisks, I removed from their positions and carried them off to Assyria. Heavy plunder and countless, I carried away from Nai or Ni, how you pronounce that. So describing, uh, again, one of the kings of Assyria, what they had done to another city. Okay, but now it's going to be the way around. So they were to, uh, habitually sending out their armies over here and over there and taking from other people. But this time it's going to go the other way. Babylon's going to take spoil from them. Okay? Other comments through verse 9. All right? So now, verse 10. What's the end result going to be? As the uh, enemy attacks and we, it describes the coming of the enemy and uh, they're not ready, none of us people are not ready uh, and they're going to be spoiled. What's the end result going to be? Verse 10. Question number... 13. Neil. Um, so they're going to be in shock. Okay. They're going to be shocking. <laughs> it's the heart melts. The knees shake. Okay. Other comments? Pain, fear, shame. Pain. Much pain on every side. She's empty, desolate, waste. And all their faces are drained of color. Okay, so fear. They're not used to losing. They're not used to being defeated and being taken spoil themselves. They're used to doing it to other people. But now, they're the ones who are going to be empty, desolate, and waste. Uh, and pain, fear, they're going, to, they're going to be defeated. And they're going to be taken captive by Babylon. Other comments, uh, Verse 10. All right, now he uses another illustration through the uh, end of the chapter, especially verse 11 and 12. A different illustration. Question number 15. What does he compare them to in verse 11 and 12? Terry. A pride of lions with the, the lion, the lioness, and the cubs. Okay, so what does the lion do for his family? Okay. 
Well, he finds food, meat, and tears it in pieces for his lionesses and cubs. Okay. So the, uh, it's, it's like a dwelling of the lions, the feeding place of the young lions. And by the way, from what I've read, young lions doesn't mean what we would call babies. That's the cubs in verse for the down. But the young lions are fierce. Um, they're uh, young, not in the sense of uh, children type things, but they're, uh, but they're not the leaders, but nevertheless, they're fierce, they're strong. And uh, this is their, their feeding place. The lions need uh, provide for the lioness and the lion's cub. Nobody makes them afraid. That's uh, what you would expect of a, uh, a place where lions dwell, okay? And so verse 12, the lion tears in pieces enough for his cubs and for his lioness, fills his caves with prey and his dens with flesh. Okay, now that's uh, describing, I believe, what Assyria is used to. That's what Assyria used to do. That's the way they used to be. But it's not going to be that way now, but that's the way it's, it, they're used to. It's going to be turned around the other way. Now, though, other commentary discussion anybody had on verse 11 and 12? Can I ask you, um, did you, well, maybe, I ask, I ask the comparison is accurate. Did you, in your study, find anything unusual about the fact, or maybe I should say expected, about the fact that he uses the illustration of lions? That's some kind of interesting information if we can tie it in. Karen. Um. Well, I believe in some of the artifacts that have been found in ruins that there are these huge lions that they used on the, for the king's throne, the palaces, the entrances to the city. Okay, lions were a very common symbol of the Assyrian, especially of their kings. So let me give you some examples of it. Uh, again, another reading. Uh, Asher Banipal, who was one of the kings of Assyria that we mentioned, also engaged in lion hunting as a sport. One relief, not on the walls, uh, found in Asher Banipal's palace at Nineveh, apparently from a second floor, had three panels depicting a lion hunt. Asher Banipal sneaks up and grabs the lion by the tail as he rears to his hind legs. Inscription above says, I, Asher Banipal, king of the universe, whoa, king of the universe, King of Assyria, in my lordly sport, I seized the lion uh, of the plain by his tail, and at the command of Urta, Nurgle, the gods, my allies, I smashed his skull with a club in my hand. So lion hunting was kind of a favorite sport among these kings, which is why it's an appropriate illustration then that they become the hunted. So as in verses 11 and 12, that's what they used to doing, but they are now the hunted. As Karen said, uh, here you see, I don't know how we hope you can see these well. These are some of, they found some of these uh, reliefs, they call them, the carvings on the walls of Asher Banipal's palace, lots of them. And I don't know how well you can make it out. I hope you can make it out. You, if you can, uh, you see here he's hand-to-hand -hand -hand combat with a lion. Here he's about to spear a lion. Uh, so the idea is that... Uh, they are fierce, the Assyrians, the kings consider themselves to be fierce that they can fight lions and so on, but in fact, they themselves are now going to the ones who are going to be destroyed, going to be punished. Okay, other comments on uh, verses, through verse 12, anybody? Okay, and then verse 13, it concludes, Let's see where I am here. Okay, so they're going to be annihilated then as a result. He says, uh, what's going to happen to them in verse 13? They're fierce, they think they're fierce lions, but what's going to happen to them? Verse 13. Frank. Uh, oh, let's see, I lost my plate. Uh, they will burn their chariots, their chariots will go up in smoke, uh, burn in the battle, and the sword shall devour their young lions, or their, the young people, or uh, their, the warriors. 
of Assyria and cut them off uh, from their prey. Okay, so they have uh, their young lions are now the ones going to be devoured. They are used to devouring others, but now they're going to be devoured. The, uh, their chariots are going to be destroyed. The sword will devour their lions, and they'll, they'll be cut off from their prey. Uh, they've been used to making other nations pray, but now they're going to be cut off from their prey, and the voice of their messengers will be heard no more. I think, I think that means like the messengers that bring in news of the, another victory and more uh, spoils and so on, but now it's, it's going to be the other way around. They're going to be defeated because God has so decreed it. Okay? Other comments through verse 13. All right, we'll go into chapter 3 next time. The thing I want us to emphasize, to remember, is that this, this is happening because of the evil of the people, and we'll see that in chapter 3. We've seen God's character, we've seen the, the punishment that Assyria is going to receive. Now we're going to see in chapter 3 why they deserve it. What, what, we've already talked about it to some extent, but chapter 3 is going to tie it all together. How evil they were, how corrupt they were. So as you study chapter 3, prepare for that discussion as you can, how corrupt and wicked Assyria was, why they deserved and God had to do the punishment that the passage describes. Anything else on chapter 2 before we close? Anybody? Okay, thank you.